In this tutorial, we'll look at lenses. The first aim is to describe how you work out the focal length of a lens, then describe how to construct ray diagrams for a convex lens, and finally explain the difference between refracting and reflecting telescopes. Now, I'm sure you're aware in our eyes we have a lens that can change shape to focus light onto the back of our eye, an area called the retina, so we can see images clearly. Sometimes our lenses aren't perfect, so we need other lenses to correct our lenses, so we can see nice clear images. But lenses are way more interesting than that. Our mastery over manufacturing lenses has enabled us to command light in a way that we can now see things we could never have seen before. No other organism on this planet can observe the universe in the way we can. Lenses have enabled us to see deep into space and see astronomically huge things like nebulae, where stars are born. Lenses have also enabled us to see extremely small things. For example, this Daphnia we can see under a microscope in detail. We can actually see its heart over here. That's all made possible through lenses. Before lenses were invented, we didn't even realise there was another kingdom of living things called the bacteria kingdom. So lenses have quite literally opened our eyes to a universe we did not know existed. There are two types of lenses. The first one is called a convex lens or converging lens. You'll know it because it's bulging outwards. This is like the lens we have in our eye. This pink line I've drawn here is called the lens axis and it runs horizontally through the center of the lens. It's an imaginary line, a bit like the normal. What convex lenses do is any light coming in or running into the lens parallel to the lens axis will be refracted or bent towards a point. When light comes together towards a point, we say light is converging. Where all the light rays meet, we have our focal point. This is where the image will form. For example, if this was your eye lens and you would have, let's say, 20-20 vision, this focal point would fall exactly on the retina, the photosensitive layer at the back of your eye. The other type of lens is called a concave or diverging lens. You can remember easily by its name, cave, because it caves in on both sides. The effect of this shape is any incoming light rays running parallel to the lens axis will diverge outwards, they will spread outwards. For this reason, concave lenses do not have a focal point because they do not bring light together to a single point. The rest of this lesson will be looking at convex lenses. So first we're going to look at how we calculate the focal length using practical equipment. So let's just define what the focal length is. The focal length is the distance between the centre of the lens, here, and where the image forms, here, at the focal point. So you can see light is coming in from an object here, they're running parallel to the lens axis. Once it gets to the centre of the lens, the lens focuses the light, converges it to a point. This is called the focal point. And the focal length is just the difference between here and here. So the distance in between these two points, the centre of the lens and the first focal point. Different lenses will have different focal lengths. This is why if you need glasses, one size doesn't fit all. Before I show you how to practically work out focal length, you need to understand one simple point. When your eyes are close to an object, the light will spread out and come in at an angle, a very sharp angle. The further away you are from an object, the less sharp this angle becomes. In fact, given more space, the light rays come in almost as if they're parallel to each other. So you can see a sharp angle here, but not here. So remember that light rays from distant objects will run parallel to each other and this is important for the next bit. So for this experiment I need a source of light, I'm using a lamp, you can see the lamp face on here so there's a light bulb there. And I need a screen upon which an image will form, then I just need something to actually make an image. Here what I'm using is a wire mesh which I'm going to fit over the lamp and I'm going to put some paper or card here in the shape of a smiley face so light can't get through. This will create a shadow of the smiley face on the screen here. So I literally just pop this on here and hopefully if I shine it, you should see a smiley face appear on the screen once it's in focus. So to test this experimentally, we need a meter ruler or a few meter rulers taped down to a table. We need to put a lens somewhere in the middle and we need a screen which we can adjust the position of. We also need light coming in from a distant source. This is so the rays come in parallel. If you remember, I just told you, the rays coming in from a distant object will come in parallel. If you remembered ray diagrams, the light rays must come in parallel to the lens axis, that line that goes through the lens. Now remember, I've got my smiley face grating here. You can't see it, but just imagine it's there. 
Now all I do is bring my screen closer and closer to the lens until I see a sharp image of a smiley face, let's say there. Then I just measure the distance between the lens or the center of the lens, this point here, and where the image focuses, the focal point. And I call this focal point one. So you can see I've marked this focal point one. So this is the focal length of this specific lens. I can mark out other focal points just by shifting the focal length and measuring the distance from the new focal point. So the next focal point will be F2, and you'd find it here. And I could keep on going. I could keep on marking out new focal points by doing the same thing. Similarly, I could do this on the other side of the lens. So I could have a focal length here to work out F1 before the lens, not after it. So now I've marked out a focal point before the lens. Now, at this point, if you're wondering why on earth am I doing this, I will actually explain a bit later on. So if you just let it go for now and understand this is how we mark out different focal points. And of course, remember the most important fact that the focal length is the distance between where the image focuses or the focal point and the lens, the center of the lens. So that's how we describe how to work out the focal length of a lens. So now I'm going to show you how to construct ray diagrams for converging lenses only. And the reason it only works for converging lenses is because we need a focal point. And remember, converging lenses produce a focal point, but diverging lenses don't because they spread out light. OK, if you've seen some of my other videos, you probably know by now I like explaining things in full detail. This is going to be one of the few exceptions to the rule. So as frustrating as this might sound, I'm going to ask you to learn what I'm saying without questioning it too much. And there's a good reason for that. Really, this is a highly, highly mathematical topic. To understand it fully, we're going into A-level and degree-level maths. This is often the case with science, especially physics. So what I ask you to do here is learn what is happening, but not necessarily understand why it's happening. OK, so here's the setup. We have our object here. I've just used a person, and light will be shining, bouncing off this person. We have a lens roughly in the middle of uh, the lens axis line. And we have another line to denote the lens center. I've also drawn the focal point here, which, as you've just seen, we can work out experimentally. So imagine I've just experimented on lens and I've worked out this is the focal length and therefore I've drawn a focal point on this diagram. The first thing you do is you draw a line, a horizontal line that's parallel to the lens axis from the tip of the object, the top of the object, to the central point of the lens and then you bend it downwards and there's another straight line going through the focal point and you keep it going. Lens diagrams only require you to draw two lines and here's the second one. From the tip of the object, but this time directly through the centre of the point, so where the lens centre meets the lens axis, it doesn't have to go through the focal point this time, just directly diagonally through the centre of the lens. And you'll see at some point it will cross the other line. Where it crosses the other line, you'll see the image form. You'll notice the image is inverted or upside down. This is what lenses do. They tend to invert the image. So remember, when doing lens diagrams, one line from the tip, the top of the uh, object, horizontal, then diagonally down through the focal point. The second line from the tip of the object and then directly through the center of the lens, diagonal all the way until it crosses. Where it crosses, that will be the tip of the image. And the image will be inverted upside down. So now uh, this is certainly a case where you just have to learn a few examples of this and not question it too much. But an object's distance will affect the image produced. So if you remember in the previous section I got you to draw different focal points. This is where they come in useful. We can draw multiple focal points to help us understand certain relationships between the object distance and the image distance and their relative sizes to each other. So for example, if I place an object two focal lengths in front of the lens, I'd expect the image to form two focal lengths behind the lens and be upside down and the same size. If, however, I put the object in between focal length one and focal length two, so between the two focal points, F1 and F2, then the image produced will fall behind F2 and it'll be much larger, still upside down, but much larger. And if that hasn't confused you yet, then let's try one more utterly bizarre one. If you put the object in front of the first focal point, in front of the lens, so in between the first focal point and the lens, what happens is the light rays will never converge. They'll just spread out. So it tricks our eyes into producing a larger image. And the image produced will actually be behind focal point two in front of the lens. 
So I imagine a magnifying glass might work a little bit like this because you have the magnifying glass really close to an object and then you see a larger image further away. Don't stress too much about this. It doesn't come up that much. Well, drawing ray diagrams doesn't come up that much. And as I said, you don't need to understand it. Just know a few examples of it. Sticking to these three should be fine. So that's how you describe how to construct ray diagrams for a convex lens, a converging lens. So there are two types of telescopes we use, refracting and reflecting, well, general types of telescopes, and they work in different ways to bring light together so we can see an image. What refracting telescopes do is they converge light coming from a distant star, so here's our objective lens, and it converges light to produce a real image at a focal point, and then the eyepiece lens enlarges it so it takes up more space on our retina so the image looks larger. So the first large lens is called the objective lens and it converges light, brings it together. This produces a real image at the focal point. This image will be smaller and inverted. So the image at this point will be smaller than what the object actually looks like and it'll be upside down. And that's no good if you think about what telescopes do. We don't want to make images smaller, we want to make them larger. That's why we need this final lens here. This is called the eyepiece lens, and eyepiece lenses always magnify the image so they take up more space on our retina. They can be both either convex or concave. Don't let that confuse you, the job is always the same, magnifies the image. This may initially feel confusing because I've told you that convex lenses bring light together and concave lenses spread them out. Now I've told you that we want these lenses to spread out light so it takes up more space on our retina and it looks bigger. So how is this possible with convex lenses? Well, it's all to do with the angle at which light meets the lens. You see, if it hits it straight on, it will converge it. But if it hits at an angle, the light can end up diverging and spreading out much like a concave lens. So remember, with refracting telescopes, objective lens converges light from a distant object. Uh, a real image will form at the focal point, which will be smaller and inverted. And then the eyepiece lens magnifies the image so we can see it. Refracting telescopes are limited though, uh, although they produce beautifully high resolution images, they're limited in terms of how far they can see. This is why reflecting telescopes are better in some ways. For example, the Hubble Space Telescope is a reflecting telescope. It's very expensive, but it allows us to take amazing pictures like this. This is an exploding star, a supernova. Refracting telescopes would not be able to see this far. The reason for that is lenses are very hard to make, okay? So if you think about an objective lens for a refracting telescope, it's very hard to make large ones, so we're limited by size. This means the aperture of the telescope, the opening which collects light, is gonna be much smaller than other telescopes, so it can't collect a lot of light and see distant faint stars. Large mirrors are much easier to manufacture, so we can make reflecting telescopes which use large concave mirrors to reflect light to make much larger telescopes with larger apertures so we can collect fainter light from more distant galaxies and stars. This is how a concave mirror works in a reflecting telescope. Just like before, I've got my axes here, I've got my object here, and I've got my first focal point here. This is a concave mirror because it caves in. The first thing you do is draw a horizontal line parallel to the axes here, and when it hits the mirror, it goes diagonally through the um, focal point. Then, like before, you do a diagonal line through the focal point and when it hits the concave mirror, it goes horizontal. So they're just opposites of each other. Where the lines cross, you will see an image and here you'll see the image is also inverted. So here we can see a reflecting telescope. You can see that the aperture is much larger. It can collect way more light and here's our light coming in from a distant star. Once again, because it's distant, the light will be coming in parallel, just like in our refracting telescope. Notice this time we do not have an objective lens, we have a concave mirror. We also have a plane mirror, which isn't caved in, just flat. And we have our eyepiece lens. So here's what happens. Light comes in from a distant object, gets reflected by the concave mirror onto the plane mirror. Then the plane mirror reflects it onto the eyepiece lens, which just like before, enlarges the image so it appears larger on our retina. So here are the key differences between refracting and reflecting telescopes. One, well, refracting telescopes give you more detailed images, whereas reflecting telescopes are less detailed. That's because we use a lens in refracting and a mirror in reflecting. Due to their smaller apertures, refracting telescopes have a limited range. They can't see very far. They certainly can't see faint stars very easily. Reflecting telescopes with much larger apertures have a much greater range.
With refracting telescopes, we use objective lenses to collect light, they converge light, whereas in a reflecting telescope, concave mirrors converge light. And finally, they both have an eyepiece lens which magnifies the image. And that is how you explain the difference between refracting and reflecting telescopes.